All right, Nico, we are live. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. On behalf of USAID, Feed the Future, and AgriLinks, I welcome you to our webinar, Tiny Microbes with Big Business Impact, the Economic and Health Implications of Food Safety. My name is Nika Larian, and I'm a food loss and waste advisor in the USAID Bureau for Resilience and Food Security Center for Nutrition. Before we begin, let me orient you to our Zoom event. On the bottom of your screen, you'll see most of your controls. First, please use the chat to introduce yourself and network with colleagues from around the world. To ask questions, please use the Q&A button in the toolbar on the left. Please indicate who your question is for. You can ask questions throughout the event and speakers will reply throughout and our Q&A session will be at the end of the webinar, time permitting. Lastly, we are recording this webinar and will email you the post-event resources as soon as they are available. You can find the resources at agrilinks.org when they are ready. Thank you for your attention. I would now like to introduce our great panel of speakers. First, we will hear opening remarks from Kelly Cormier, Food Safety Division Chief from the USAID Bureau for Resilience and Food Security Center for Nutrition. And then we will hear from our great panelists, which include Cindy Jinks, General Manager of Pick and Pay South Africa, Haley Oliver, the Director of the Feed the Future Innovation Lab for Food Safety, and Lisa Corston, Professor of Microbiology and Plant Pathology at the University of Pretoria. Thank you all for joining today, and I will now hand it over to Kelly. Thanks, Nika. Hello and welcome. My name is Kelly Cormier and I lead USAID's Food Safety Division. We promote and oversee increased investment in addressing food safety risks in support of the US government's global food security strategy. Together with partners, we're exploring ways to improve the enabling environment for food safety in different parts of food systems, including local food systems. It's my pleasure to introduce USAID's Food Safety Month webinar. It's our fourth since the World Health Organization declared June 7th World Food Safety Day. I look forward to this month every year. It's a chance for me and my team to, with all of you, take stock of new evidence and the current context. Globally, conflict and climate change threaten, to, threaten the advances that we've made to reduce poverty, hunger, and malnutrition. Without safe food, we're not able to properly address the food security issues that are central to our strategy. At USAID, we're focused on expanding local consumer access to and affordability of safe, nutritious food to improve diets. It's not acceptable that safer food in lower and middle income countries is directed to international markets in compliance with market standards. While the domestic costs of unsafe food remaining within borders for domestic consumption are still not well monitored. This puts people at risk. 
Today's webinar will explore the links between food safety and impacts on human health and nutrition, including the long-term effects of food poisoning. It will also explore the economic impact of unsafe food that must be discarded, undermining efforts to increase the availability, access, and affordability of safe and nutritious food. Today, you will hear from a panel of both private sector and research partners who will share perspectives on how to influence the safety of food in lower middle income countries. Over to our panelists. Thank you for those remarks, Kelly. We'll now hand it over to Cindy Jenks. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this conversation. I've been asked to present a retailer perspective on managing food safety risks within the retail and supply chain. Um, microscopic organisms may be visible to the naked eye, but the effects are felt far and wide, shaping industries, influencing consumer behavior, and safeguarding our well-being. When we talk about food safety, we need to ensure that measures are taken to ensure that the food we serve to our, sell to our consumers, our customers, are free from harmful contaminants, including bacteria, viruses, parasites, and toxins. The consequences of, these, of overlooking these measures can be severe, resulting in foodborne illness, economic losses, and damage to public trust. Therefore, understanding the economic and health implications of food safety is of utmost importance. If we can move to the next slide, please. So what are the significant food safety risks that are facing or challenges that are facing us in South Africa? Currently, we have a situation in South Africa where we have load shedding that has the biggest impact on the economy and the foods, it impacts food safety as well as food security. So what do I mean by load shedding? What load shedding means is that the power grid that cannot cope with the volume of power that is required by the country. So the, the government switches off the power for certain periods during the day so that they can keep the, the grid from falling over. What this results is that suppliers need to put in infrastructure to ensure that they can continue producing when the power is down. This really has an impact on small suppliers as they don't have the financial means to put in backup systems to allow production to continue. Many suppliers, for many suppliers, this means that they have the power supplies that they install for alternate power, um, they've had to, sorry, they've had to install alternate power sources such as generators, solar systems, and batteries. These alternate power sources were initially put in place to handle emergency situations, but they're now being used on a daily basis as the energy source to power the plants, refrigerations, ovens, and hot boxes. So from a pick and pay perspective, this puts a huge strain on our stores. We need to ensure that our stores are, enable, are, are able to produce during the load shedding periods and that we are able to supply safe food within the correct temperature parameters to our consumers. We also need to ensure that our production schedules are in place so that we don't have food carried over post load shedding that could result in a risk to our customers. In addition to load shedding, water quality is a problem. Um, <clears throat> load shedding results in water towers running dry, resulting in areas without water. It stops production if sites do not have self-contained water solutions. To add to that, the water quality within South Africa is now questionable. And Professor Lisa Corsten will cover that in her presentation. According to the World Health Organization, an estimated 6 million people worldwide fall ill each year due to consuming contaminated food, and tragically 420,000 of them lose their lives. These statistics underscore the urgency and significance of prioritizing food safety as a public and health concern. Food safety, uh, foodborne illness can range from mild discomfort to se severe cases requiring hospitalization. They're caused by various pathogens, the vulnerable populations, including children and the elderly and the compromised immune, those with compromised immune systems are particularly susceptible to serious consequences of foodborne infections. Next slide, please. So poor water and lack of water leads to poor hygiene and sanitation. Lack of water prevents food handlers from washing their hands, which is the most effective tool towards food safety. Clean hands stop the spread of microorganisms, which contribute to foodborne illness. 
Lack of water prevents effective sanitation as water is essential in the cleaning processes. This leads to dirty surfaces, which aids in the growth of microorganisms. And this within our stores is a particular challenge because we've got to ensure that all food safety of all food service areas are food safe at all times. Next slide, please. So the link between food safety and food security in South Africa, according to the UN, um, access to safe and secure food supply is a basic human right. Everybody needs to be able to have um, either a plant source or an animal source on a daily basis. There's an urgent need for the rising awareness and the limitations of many de developing nations and those susceptible to food insecurity. Policymakers must ensure that safe food is a top priority in integrating food safety and nutrition in food security policies and programs. The food we eat must be nutritious and safe, and we often ignore and overlook the issue of food safety. Many foodborne diseases, either acute poisoning or chronic exposure, are highly, largely unreported. Other factors that affect food security are poverty, climate change, loss of biodiversity dependence and fossil fuel, and the use of crops for biofuels. The interrelationship between food security and food safety is shown in the graph on the presentation on the slide. Next slide, please. So the link between food safety and food security within the South African context, again referring to load shedding, this is not only a risk to food safety, but to food security too. As I mentioned previously, while infrastructure, there are infrastructure costs needed to keep big facilities running, in certain industries it's just not viable, resulting in total shutdown, as these facilities do not have the power for long enough periods to start up the facility to get product through the facility, resulting in no production, resulting in no stock available in the stores for customers. Smaller suppliers and smaller farmers that don't have the infrastructure to operate during load shedding how are they maintaining product integrity within the facilities on production lines when the power goes off for extended periods? We as a retailer have put processes in place to monitor quality and food safety through micro, continuous micro testing to validate processes that are in place with the supply base. Statistics show that a third of the food produced ends up as food waste while we have starving people. We need to focus, we need to focus on this that foods produced are used to feed hungry people. We need to look at various avenues to process food waste or divert food to food banks to limit stock going to landfills. To address economic and health implications of food safety, collaboration among stakeholders is critical. Governments must enforce robust food safety regulations, provide resources for inspections and surveillance, and support research and innovation in the field. The private sector, including food producers, processors, and retailers, must embrace their role as custodians of food safety by implementing stringent quality control measures, fostering transparency, and promoting consumer education. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cindy, for sharing the food safety challenges faced in South Africa by a major retailer. And of course, I love that you mentioned food waste. I'll now hand it over to Haley Oliver. Hi, everyone. My name is Haley Oliver, and I'm a faculty member in the Department of Food Science at Purdue University, but I also have the pleasure of serving as the director of the USAID Feed the Future Food Safety Innovation Lab. Next slide, please. The Food Safety Innovation Lab um, was started at Purdue University in 2019 in conjunction with Cornell University um, and co-leadership. Next slide, please. The Food Safety Innovation Lab, as I mentioned, is unique among innovation labs in that both Purdue University and Cornell University jointly um, manage this uh, Food Safety Innovation Lab. And it's our job to foster the research investment of USAID to enhance our understanding globally of food safety. So we leverage global experts from all over the world in locally led projects to address root causes of foodborne illness. 
And as an innovation lab, we truly focus on uh, microbial foodborne disease. There's been tremendous investments um, that, have, that have been made in, in all forms of food safety, including chemical hazards such as aflatoxins. But we, we see that in from a few meta-analyses that there's been a limited investment so far on microbial hazards, which actually cause the vast majority of foodborne illnesses. So we, we thought it was a good investment to focus these resources on enhancing awareness of microbial foodborne hazards. And we're doing that in, um, in Bangladesh, Cambodia, Kenya, Nepal, Nigeria, and Senegal. Next slide, please. Why do we think about food safety? Well, it's really a pillar of food security. We can have enough food, it can be nutritious, it can get to the populations that need it, but if it's not safe, it truly isn't food. And we know that foodborne illnesses are a major co contributor to malnutrition. They can have lifelong negative health effects, we can prevent many of them, and they are certainly an economic burden. And I think it's a great um, theme that we've picked for this webinar, tiny microbes, but, but big impact. And we can certainly see that play out in loss of life and economic burden. So food safety, uh, from a research standpoint, our goal is to remove some of the barriers to economic growth um, and to, in, to minimize its impact globally. Next slide, please. The Food Safety Innovation Lab has really four pillars of research and engagement activities, which are awareness, research, policy, and training. And if we look across each one of our research investments, so all six of them at this point in time, almost every one of them touches on these four pillars, where we're recognizing, um, as we're in the, this is the first Food Safety Innovation Lab, really building awareness, and that can be from from the primary consumer, so household level, all the way up to more developed food systems, increasing food safety awareness is really key to moving the needle on, on improving the safety of food, but also consumer demand and interest in, make, in requiring that food be safer. So of course, we're a major research investment ourselves, but our goal is to build local research capacity and to conduct research on regional food safety challenges that are important to our in-country partners. As we look forward, um, taking the research that has been conducted, our learnings from it, we see great opportunities for that to impact policy. And so as we look forward, we'll be taking our learnings to see how we can best influence uh, positive outcomes in food safety. And all along, um, from the beginning of our research investment to the end, we are training individuals, we're training people from the private sector, but certainly students. Um, the next generation of scientists is a big part um, of what our research investment is actually building. Next slide, please. When we think about food safety, we really recognize that it's multidimensional um, when it comes to our research investment. So. Again, we've elected to focus on foodborne disease that are caused by pathogens um, and, some, and other contaminants, but the vast majority of our investment is really focusing on foodborne pathogens, such as Salmonella, Campylobacter, and E. coli. And a number of our research investments are, are focusing on critical control points. So those points in a, in a food's life from primary production to the time a consumer consumes it, that can be, that can be the opportunity for us to reduce the risk of that food or prevent it from becoming unsafe. A number of our research partners really focus on social and behavior science, which is very key to changing behavior. So how do we increase consumer awareness of food safety? How do we increase demand for it? How do we elevate um, producers' awareness of it as well so that they can be inherently building food safety into their systems? But of course, we cannot forget about the importance of economics. If we don't have demand for safer food or if the costs and benefits to producers and communities um, are not apparent, then we really don't have a, a lot of motivation then for food safety. So we're elevating both of those and recognizing that creating safe food can have a price, but that it will certainly be offset by the global health benefits of such. Next slide, please. So three examples of each of those pillars. In Cambodia, our team is measuring the capabilities and opportunities and motivations of vegetable producers, of, of foods that are very key to the Cambodian diet, um, where they can influence food safety from primary production all the way to final point of sale to consumers in, in local markets. In Bangladesh, 
there's a great focus in our research portfolio focusing on consumer demand for safer fish, where fish is a, a very key uh, part of the diet, and to actually quantify the economic benefits of improved food safety for the welfare of consumers. So again, bringing to the table the language of cost and benefits um, and being able to then use that information to direct policy that will be effective in the future. In Nepal, there's a great focus on understanding consumer and producer food safety behaviors to identify factors that, you, that drive supply of and demand for safer salad vegetables, such as cucumbers and tomatoes. So again, we think about it from a behavior standpoint, from who are the microbes, what are the challenges, but then also economics, um, because there has to be an economically viable dynamic for foods to actually, for them, for us to really recognize and see safe foods. Next slide, please. So our, what the Food Safety Innovation Lab implementation strategy, our job, which is a really quite a, a fun job at the end of the day, is to implement uh, the research portfolio on behalf of USAID. And so what we do is we've identified needs early on in the project where we were able to then define our research strategy and research priorities. We had publicly uh, open calls for food safety uh, research, and we went through a competitive process, two iterations of them actually to date, where we then select and fund those research projects that have U.S. and um, in-country uh, research partners. We have a very active research portfolio at this point in time as we're in year four of our, of our funds um, and our project, and so we are actively evaluating research results. So um, we had two webinars to celebrate Food Safety uh, Month, and so you can see some updates of, of work we're interested in, particularly around risk assessment looking forward. But you should have a uh, little we'll display at the end of this talk, and I think even in the chat, access to our research portfolio through our website and our social media. So we're continuing to disseminate, obviously, our our research findings to the field, and we'll continue to do so as, as the projects are extraordinarily active at this point in time. Next slide, please. If we look across the, the collaborators in the Food Safety Innovation Lab, there's over 25 research partners, um, 14 in the US and 14 research institutions internationally that come together to work on food safety. And it really does take a network such as this for us to move the needle on truly improving food safety, um, understanding the challenges, finding practical, economically viable solutions, and then influencing policy in the future. Next slide, please. It takes a whole team of us in order for us to actually achieve um, management of such a program or in a large research portfolio of this as this. So uh, just briefly, this is the Food Safety Innovation Lab team um, located at Purdue University and Cornell University. Next slide, please. Our research portfolio, as I mentioned, um, is active in six different countries. And what we do focus on is nutrient-dense, perishable foods. So certainly in the theme of loss and waste, food will be lost and wasted because of food safety challenges. And we focus on those products that have short shelf lives that are nutrient dense because they also inherently have the potential to be less safe. Next slide, please. I've already mentioned, but just briefly in Bangladesh, we're focusing on um, on ability to improve the safety of fish and consumers' willingness to pay or and investigating consumers' willingness to pay for safer produced fish. Next slide, please. In Cambodia, we focus on contamination routes or, such as salmonella, campylobacter, of, of transmission of those organisms from primary production at the farm all the way to the consumer to look for opportunities to improve safety and to prevent cross-contamination in that system. Next slide, please. In Kenya, we're focusing on poultry production where we know that um, poultry um, inherently can be a challenge because of salmonella and campylobacter. We're looking at opportunities for women producers to reduce salmonella within the flocks and to re also reduce it um, as, the, as poultry is being processed for human consumption. So a lot of opportunities to reduce risk in that space. Next slide, please. In Senegal, we focus on the dairy value chain, looking at small to very small um, dairy producers 
um, to enhance awareness of what the food safety challenges are of milk, particularly milk that's consumed raw, and how we can improve um, demand for safer foods is certainly an interest that we have in the future. Um, because we know that milk is, while a nutrient dense and, and high value um, from that standpoint, it can also carry a number of foodborne illnesses. So finding safe handling practices that also are aligned with the realities uh, in Senegal. We've, we've heard about um, cold chain and, and the challenges with power. That certainly would be something that would resonate in this context as well. Next slide, please. In Nepal, um, I've already really talked about this, but we're looking at, at salad vegetables and how we can use a market-led approach or really consumer demand and ability and what is the willingness to pay for safer foods, fruits and veg safer vegetables in Nepal. Next slide, please. Nigeria, we focus on household and community awareness of food safety. So this is a really fascinating project that really goes to the household level um, to that, that um, where we're looking at what are the realities of food safety and what are some you know, low barrier to entry effective ways that we can en enhance awareness and safety of handling food and safe food decisions at the household level. Next slide, please. So if you wish to connect with us, here's an opportunity to do so. We're, we're very active on, on social media and certainly have an up-to-date website where we can showcase all of the exciting research that's ongoing. Thanks for the opportunity to discuss the Food Safety Innovation Lab. Back over to you, Mika. If it isn't safe, it isn't food. Thanks, Haley. And lastly, uh, Lisa Corston. It's, uh, good afternoon or good morning, everybody all over the world. Uh, thank you for this wonderful opportunity. I'm looking forward to, uh, to just share with you a few slides, uh, some of our experience. And if I can have the next slide. So let me first put Africa in the global context. Uh, it's very important to keep in mind that traditional trade routes primarily uh, circumvent in this continent. And as we all know, there's this rich biodiversity in the African continent. Um, we have unique foods in, in our continent. Uh, yet Africa, as a continent is still the most food insecure. So uh, we may also debate and put forward the impact of power relations, um, very importantly, uh, the trade. Um, and with trade always comes pests, pathogens, and uh, the impact of that on uh, food sovereignty, a country's ability to provide enough food for its people. Now, what was really interesting was during this uh, Ukraine war period, where we had a block in these trade routes and the African continent and particularly exporting countries could not move their products out of uh, the continent. So we, we had an increase in regional trade. Um, but what was also imp in interesting was during the COVID period, we had a total lockdown, um, even despite the fact that the continent had the least cases in, in terms of COVID. We had a lockdown and we couldn't move food to the people that most needed it. So the question around food sovereignty is as important as food security. Are we able to provide enough food for all the people? It is a basic human right, access to food, but also access to safe food. And uh, as we all know, if it's not safe, it's not food. Next slide. Now, um, with this slide, and I'm sorry, it's, uh, it, it just cut off. It didn't come through. But, but what's very interesting of this slide, it actually projects Africa and the impact of climate change and specifically on the impact of, of food safety. And we do know that uh, the FIO clearly states that climate change is increasing and it will increase the risk of foodborne diseases. Now, the two points that I want to highlight, besides the impact on, on uh, the fishing industry, where we expect a 50% drop, um, the maize, where we expect 35% drop due to drought, we also expect a, a crop yield drop 20 percent um, and we we face severe water shortages in the continent 
Now, what is important is if you look at the impact of the foodborne pathogens, and it's not only the foodborne pathogens, we need to move this discussion to uh, a water and sanitation level, because we do know that we will get an increase in, in cholera outbreaks. What is so interesting, next slide, is that South Africa has recently had a cholera outbreak, and I'm going to touch on that very briefly. But if we look at uh, the if WHO's map, uh, once again, putting Africa in the middle of the table in terms of food safety, what do we know in terms of foodborne diseases? Um, we know that there's not adequate capacity. There's not adequate capacity to do surveillance, uh, to do diagnostic services, and to monitor the whole food system uh, in the continent. So uh, do we have a scenario of a lack of scientific data? Or do we have less or more safer food? Uh, so these are critically important research questions for all of us. And once again, um, there is no food security without safe food. Next slide. Now, this is some of the amazing work that's that's been done, that's been reported, and uh, we now have a, a food safety index. Uh, we already have 20 countries that's uh, submitted this food safety index. And what is important is that this will give us a measure and a tool to assess the ability to effectively regulate. Do we have the legislative frameworks? Do we have the capacity, the competency? Can we effectively regulate uh, the food sector? What is very important about this is we need to consider the informal food sector, uh, because at the end of the day, food security is still the key within the continent. Next slide. Now, let me ship, uh, move over to, to research, and, and then specifically I want to touch on, on our own research, because um, one of the FAO, once again, key pillars is that sound, sound science underpins food safety. Now, in the case of Africa and the African continent, and I'm going to use South Africa as an example, we actually only have two major research centers where a lot of scientific uh, data can be generated. We do have a whole network of, of laboratories. These are accredited laboratories. But what is so interesting about this, when we had the listeria outbreak in South Africa, we could not, or government specifically, could not access that information. So the information was there. We actually knew beforehand something is busy happening. And the researchers were already picking up signals. We were already detecting listeria in the food system. But because we couldn't put all the information together and because we don't have risk assessment capacity, we could actually not provide an effective risk management strategy. And we didn't have all the role players around the table. With a subsequent delay on detecting the source and actually removing all affected food products from our food system. Uh, and this, as you all know, caused the loss and the death of, of more than 200 people. And um, it had a severe impact on, on the image of South Africa being a food safe country, primarily focusing on exporting a lot of our fresh produce. And, and food safety is also about trust. It's trust in the whole supply chain. But it's also important that decision makers interact with the scientists and with industry so that we can actually form a platform to share this information and support each other. Because it's important for the country and for the continent. What is also important for us is do we have uh, uh, adequate capacity to, to do method optimization, uh, effective detection, rapid detection, and then uh, a ma a major surveillance systems. And yes, uh, this is important because it will direct policy um, through our research findings. Um, can I get a next slide? So I want to share with you just two slides. Um, three slides with uh, one of the interesting um, projects we've done. And we've actually done a network analysis and that's just literally going through all the published uh, information. Um, 
and, and the formal publications, and that's not using uh, AI to do the, the more uh, informal or social platforms, but just assessing uh, where's all the research going. So the more yellow the dot, uh, the more recent. So then you can actually start uh, assessing where's the focus, what's the connections that scientists are making all over the world. So what is interesting, if you put food safety in the middle, then it's quite clear that salmonella stands out. So most of our researchers are focusing on salmonella. We also know it's the leading cause of, of death in Africa and the African continent. And of course, globally, salmonella is extremely important. And then, of course, there's hysteria um, that's always um, uh, in the background, very important. And we can actually then look at the relationships between the different focus areas. Um, and I want to highlight one area, and that is antimicrobial resistance. And this is one of the big emerging topics at the moment, and specifically in, in the African continent. Next slide. Now, if we also further unwrap um, the literature and the connectedness, and you can once again see the antimicrobial resistance being high, meaning all the publications coming out during 2019, 20, 21, 22. So there's a definite shift, obviously a shift in funding, and then obviously a shift in research outputs, and that's hopefully directing uh, government and policy. And we do now see that there is a call for a national surveillance program in South Africa. In fact, we've just had a One House uh, meeting um, uh, this afternoon, a global One House meeting, and we were discussing uh, surveillance and um, uh, the key research focus areas that we should focus on within animal health, plant health, and environmental health. So this is very important. It's also very clear the link between foodborne pathogens, um, irrigation water, um, water quality in general, and then also um, public health and, and the food safety risk factors. Next slide. Uh, the last point that I, I want to highlight in terms of the, the network analysis was uh, the close association that we found between water and food safety, and then specifically fresh, fresh produce, fruit and vegetables, um, and the increasing interest in this in, in the African continent. And then very interesting, the link with Vibrio. And uh, that takes me to um, uh, the next slide where I just want to refer back to the Vibria outbreak. So um, it's literally happening at, in my back door. It's, uh, it happened, the outbreak was first reported in an area where we are currently doing our research. We were not focusing on Vibria. We were primarily focusing on antimicrobial resistance, salmonella and E. coli. And we were actually monitoring it on the farms, uh, monitoring it from the irrigation water, the crops, uh, the 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 processing plants up to the point of retail and sales and even up to the consumer's table. Um, we then rapidly had to, um, first of all, get primer sets, uh, get the methodology ready, and the industry asked us to immediately start looking at cholera. And specifically the, the Vibrio looking at what is the impact on fresh produce. If, if you use water that's um, polluted, uh, contaminated, and what is then your risk on the, the fresh produce that's obviously eaten without further processing. Now, what's interesting, I want to just uh, refer back. These are newspaper reports that came out. We had an outbreak. Um, it was actually during 2008 and 2009. And during that period, there was already 1,100 laboratory cases reported. There were 64 deaths. So why is it happening again? And why are we unable to actually effectively monitor and, and prevent this? So what was interesting in this uh, specific report that um, they, they highlighted the importance to, um, to have the capacity in terms of early detection and to have appropriate management uh, in place and active surveillance programs. So that clearly um, highlights the importance of research and integrated research networks. We need to sit around the table and we need to have these collaborative programs. And I, and I think the previous speakers highlighted the importance of creating these networks. Next slide. Now, 
I want to just uh, pause a little bit with uh, antimicrobial resistance, um, and this is really uh, an emerging a major challenge for us. And um, it's the first time we've really seen effective communication, uh, transdisciplinary affection, uh, interaction and communication where we um, have the human health, uh, animal health and plant health and environmental health. Um, a scientist sitting around the table with government and engaging them and actually focusing on um, accelerating the progress um, in countries, developing countries, looking at innovation, um, more effective collaboration and integration of our research work, and, um, and to get big funding to support these networks of research. And it's uh, only unless we can effectively do this that we will be able to address these major concerns. So um, we know once again from the FAO, they, they've highlighted the importance of, um, uh, in terms of animal production, the importance of using antimicrobials and the responsible use of that. Um, but we also have hard cold facts on the table in terms of foodborne and waterborne diarrhea diseases and, and the number of people it's killing. So it's not only your foodborne pathogens, um, but we need to think of this integrated uh, interaction and specifically antimicrobial resistance genes circulating through um, this system. Next slide. So I just want to end by touching on some of our research work. We have a, a, an amazing group of masters and PhD and postdoctoral students, and we are actually doing comparative studies comparing the formal um, sector to the informal sector. So keeping in mind our formal uh, agricultural sector is primarily export orientated. So they will, most of them will be compliant with Global Gap. Um, they will have large scale farms. They will have very effective irrigation systems. They will actually have uh, water purification plants on the farm. And uh, most of them will have export agents and um, will export the bulk of their produce uh, into Europe mainly, and then also into Asian or um, the US countries. Um, so what is also interesting is that most farms will have on farm a big pack house or even then move to central processing plants. And then from there, it goes to big distribution centers into retail, either local retail or um, be exported. A small percentage of the product will go into our informal market and the local markets. So we expect that produce to be safe. And we have tested this. We've, we've looked at the presence of salmonella and listeria, and we have at times detected it on certain products and crops. Um, and then what we've done is parallel, parallel research to look at the informal sector. So these will be small scale farmers. Uh, the produce will be harvested, immediately placed in the back of a, a vehicle and moved into the informal trade sector, uh, informal settlements where it will be traded. And the question was asked early on, is the food in this system less safe than in the formal sector? And after extensive research of many years, um, the interesting finding was that the food is not necessarily less safe. And the reason is that the food chain is so short. Literally from harvest to consumption, we are talking about days. It's, it's small farmers near these areas where they sell the produce. Whatever is sold today will be consumed today. There is no fridges, there is no water um, for, for washing. Um, so it's harvest and consumption and uh, a very short uh, supply chain. Next slide. And, and this is just uh, some of the research results. And what was very interesting was, was looking at multi-drug uh, resistance genes moving through this um, from highly polluted river water, water that's then pumped into holding dams, um, used in irrigation, both in um, small scale and large scale farms. And unless the farm has a, a means to, to manage the water, clean the water, um, they, they do have the risk of, of contaminated water on the crop. So we do pick up um, some of these organisms. And what was interesting in this case, uh, this was just showing you some of the Serratia uh, E. coli and Klebsiella in, in this case, but was the high prevalence of multi-drug resistance. Uh, in these microbes. And we picked this up throughout the whole chain. Can we get the next slide? Now, um, um, my last uh, slide or two was just to show you that what we've done was really 
to uh, start doing metadata analysis and comparing uh, not only the methods used within the continent, but also some of the results that we found. So this was interesting. Um, countries using, for instance, uh, PCR analysis um, was, was quite prevalent, but only two countries used, for instance, whole genome sequencing. So that could be my big, next big challenge to the African continent is that we need to adopt the best technology, and we need to plug into international networks. Uh, and this is crucial for the future and, and the safety of fresh produce uh, in the continent. Um, and then my last slide, I think this will be my last slide, with just to, to leave you with final few thoughts on the moral and legal issues around safe food. Um, we often assess quality parameters in food and food would therefore be rejected because it does not comply with, with certain quality standards. Um, so how does that compare to, to food safety standards? Um, what about product recalls? What happens to these products? Um, what happens to products that's rejected, particularly at the ports, um, both um, in, in this continent or then the produce that's then exported? What happens to past sell by date? What happens about leftover food in restaurants, um, food in the waste dumps and, and food that's declared unfit for human consumption? I'm asking this questions, uh, these questions um, from a food security point of view. Keeping in mind the original photograph I showed you of the African continent, and uh, our incredible challenge to ensure that everyone has food on their plate at least every day. And I think this could be a nice point to end my discussion and open it up for, for further um, discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lisa. I, I agree. Ending that note on the, the balance between food safety and food loss and waste and food security concerns is a very, Great start to our discussion. We have about 13 minutes for questions. And we already have some questions in the Q&A box, but I encourage you to continue to enter those uh, using the Q&A function so that our panelists can, uh, can answer your questions. There have been several of our participants that are interested in this concept of raising consumer awareness of and consumer demand for safer food. Kelly, I know that, that you started to respond in the Q&A box, but I'd like to give you the opportunity to speak more to the work that Eat Safe and Business Drivers has been doing in uh, raising consumer awareness and consumer demand. And uh, Haley, I know that you mentioned consumer demand as well in the, the Dairy Senegal project, so would also love to hear your thoughts too, but over to Kelly. Sure, thanks, Nika. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, the fact is we, we really, can't um, answer Dick's question. It was, it, 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 we had one of the participants um, ask about: Do the majority of consumers perceive uh, that perceive the that food is unsafe in lower middle income countries? You know, we can't answer that, and we're still and so we're really working hard to um, to understand in a context specific way what um, what consumers perceive as safe or unsafe. One of the things that we're learning through um, some operational research, in particular with um, business drivers for food safety and eat safe. These are USAID projects um, uh, that are implemented by uh, partners, uh, GAIN and uh, Food Enterprise Solutions. We're, we're learning that, uh, that perceptions can depend on the kind of food. Um, and, um, and I know I'm really excited to, uh, to translate our learning into, um, into approaches that help us uh, appreciate um, how um, how to influence behavior changes, how to inf how to motivate um, vendor behavior, um, et cetera. So we're really testing the hypothesis that consumers have a role to play in affecting uh, the practices, um, the food safety practices um, among vendors. Um, but there's this is a really big research agenda that needs a lot of further exploration. So I'll stop there and, and, and allow our research partners themselves to speak to some of the things that they're finding. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Kelly. And, and I think you framed it well. It's a big question and there's, there's no one easy solution to how do we elevate awareness. Um, I think you know, the challenge, and it's a challenge that we embrace 
by taking on food safety from the microbiological perspective, microbes are difficult because you can't see them. And they're, you know, that that's a that's kind of a I don't want to call it a leap of faith, but being able to say, you know, this milk is more or less safe, whether it has been heat treated or not, if we're using it in the dairy context, that's that's kind of you almost need a lived experience in a way for me to understand why I need to make the investment in a pasteurizer and maintaining it, for example, to improve the safety of milk. If, if I don't understand or have a, a concept around that microbes exist, even though I can't see it, that that is a challenge. It's a it's a conceptual barrier. And I think it's why investments in, um, in other food safety challenges like aflatoxins and, and pesticide residue um, why that can be a little more tangible and and I think progress has been made in that space is because we can see that we can see you know actual damage and, and, and loss of of corn kernels for example or, or soybeans we can also see application of pesticides we don't see the application of salmonella we don't we don't see it move and and I think you know that's that's an important job that we have from a research standpoint is to demonstrate or find where those challenges really are and to to disseminate and to talk about why that is a challenge and that goes in many directions to the consumer and building awareness to demand safer food but also to inform policy um, that's practical and, and and that can actually be implemented and have an impact of course is our goal so we have to work with local national regional governments to increase their awareness and and how they can build policy into their systems that protect consumers, but, you know, but, but place a reasonable demand on the private sector that, you know, that has to do the work of actually improving safe food. So it's complicated, but, you know, I'm really excited that, you know, USAID has made these investments to start the discussion and to really set the foundation for what the food safety challenges are across all biological, chemical, and physical hazards, and what we can be doing collectively as a research community globally to, to improve that is a really exciting thing. So we appreciate that, the opportunity. Thank you, Kelly and Haley for those responses. And I'd like to point out that we have um, great representatives from Eat Safe and Business Drivers in the chat um, providing links as well. So if, if you'd like to hear more about those activities, please, um, please check those out. We had a, a follow-up question or concern raised um, from Dick about the costs of improving food safety. And, and since, as the title of this webinar says, we're focusing on the business impacts of food safety. So Cindy, I'd like to ask you, how do we make the, the business case to the private sector for improving food safety? And of course, reducing food loss and waste plays into this. So I'd, I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on this. Thank you very much. Um, within our context, food safety, it's a difficult one because it's not a given. All right, so we've got to ensure that the product that we sell to our consumers is safe. So in order, what we have seen over the years is when suppliers are implementing food safety management systems and food safety systems within their um, supply base, and we look at the before and after results after they've, um, after they've implemented a food safety system, we will see that there is an improvement in the management control in the facility, the, um, the waste control in the facility, and it provides us with a longer shelf life product. So when it provides a product, with, when we get a product with a longer shelf life, it enables us to have a longer time to sell the product within our stores, and it also gives the customer the confidence that their product is going to last the entire um, shelf life, because ultimately we need to be looking to reduce food waste. So food safety is always seen as a cost to the system, but I think if you weigh the pros and cons of food safety um, with or without food safety and the implications on a business, you absolutely seen a benefit to the business if there is a system in place. And we've seen that over the years. We implemented a food safe, the food safety system within our organization over 25 years ago. And if we look at it over the last 10 years to where we are today, we can definitely see the improvement within our own stores because of the food safety systems implemented and within our supply base. And I think suppliers themselves are realizing that if we do implement food safety systems, it is a a large, a wider benefit. It's not just a small benefit, it's a wider benefit across food waste, food security, and safe food to customers.
Thank you for your response, Cindy. You mentioned the, the need for collaboration, which I think came through in Lisa's presentation as well during her discussion of, of the outbreak and their inability to create a risk management strategy. So Lisa, I'd love to hear from you um, if you could elaborate more for that need for collaboration and communication between policymakers, researchers, and industry in a successful food safety system. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I think it's critical to have access to the best experts with, and I'm, I'm saying this uh, specifically referring to certain pathogens. So I'm going to use Cyclospora, for instance. I think there's maybe two experts in, in well, in Africa, maybe, uh, that's really able to detect it rapidly, effectively, consistently, where the methods are of working um, and I, I think having access to international expert, experts will be key. Um, we have these re-emerging pathogens all the time. Um, with the listeria outbreak at the time, we had the FDA who stepped in and immediately supplied us with material. Experts, they literally, um, there was two experts that came to South Africa and immediately helped us and enabled us to rapidly uh, uh, roll out detections and surveillance and uh, and I think that's key so you have to have your network and of course networks will always be about trust relationships uh, and an understanding of your capacity and ability within your context and your country uh, and your framework so um, it's important to work together to have access to the top laboratories in the world. Um, I'm going to use an example. One of my PhD students is now going to the USA for three months for training and risk assessment. And we hope that when she gets back, she will retain that network and she will grow that field for us and, and train more students um, in South Africa. And, and that will hopefully spill over into the rest of the, of the continent. So that's extremely important to have um, off the shelf capacity and capability to rapidly step in and address it. That's why the cholera outbreak was so interesting and the listeria one. Uh, and then normal surveillance um, um, over time so that you can um, pick up on these and you can actually immediately stop with your risk management. I want to take a step back to risk communication because that's the third, third very importantly. There's been a very interesting study done by the World Health Organization. And, and um, in fact, if I was also involved in it, and there was actually guidelines um, in terms of training and education programs and awareness programs for, for street vendors. And it was very effective. And I remember we did surveys with, with street vendors and they were away. We did a school feeding program survey in South Africa and, and um, people handling food were away. So I don't think we must think because it's an informal sector, people don't know how, what food safety is about. They, they know what it's about to get sick from food that's not good. And there's an inherent knowledge. We asked um, waste pickers and they said, we said, how um, when you consume food and you, you select food out of a waste bin, how do you know you can eat it? It's safe. And they said, you know what? We use our instinct. We use smell and, and the feel if it's slimy and if it looks funny. So they, they have their own natural way of assessing it and that doesn't mean we we do not have to look at improving food safety standards at all layers in the country but it has to be fit for purpose it cannot be a, a big commercial farm, farm's food safety standard what is true is that if you have a lot of your producers in your country compliant with good food safety standards the spill off into your local food supplies will be great because not everything gets sold or exported so you will get a general better quality of food in your country and a better safety level in your country in any way. I can maybe just comment on one of the um, questions and that was in terms of land. What, what about availability of land in the continent? And I said, I want to say, I wouldn't be worried about the land. I think there's enough. I would be more worried about climate change and the impact of that and, and the expected increase in, in, in diseases, emerging and re-emerging diseases. Thank you. Thank you for that response, Lisa, and, to, and for that connection to, to climate. I, I want to take this time to thank all of our panelists for their great presentations and, and to you, our participants, for this very engaging discussion. 
We would love to continue this conversation uh, in, in celebration of World Food Safety Day, which was earlier this month on June 7th. We have a suite of, of content on AgriLinks, a full month of food safety content. So please, I encourage you to, to check out the post, to check out the, the podcast, to continue the conversation that was started here today. But, but thank you to all of you, our participants, our panelists for, for this time. I, I really enjoyed the conversation that we had today about food safety and its economic and health impacts.